So, welcome to the first session of the public input for the public comment draft of the 2024 10-year telecom plan. I think I fit all those words in there um, correctly. So in this meeting, what we will do is Alex will present a, or I guess we can go to the next slide and go over the agenda. <laughs> sure. Do we want to start recording? Oh yeah, oh, I'm yes. sorry. Also, this meeting is going to be recorded so that we can turn any verbal comments into written comments so that we'll have them turn on transcribed notes. too. Yep, transcribed and recorded. The recording should, will be posted to the website. We should um, wait to hear that. Oh, we don't get an audio. Somebody's got it muted. We are now recording. All right. So this meeting is going to be recorded and transcribed. The recording will be posted to the website most likely tomorrow morning when I get back into the office with my computer, um, just so everybody is aware. So again, this is the first meeting of the public comment session for the public comment draft of the 10-year telecom plan. So the format of this meeting is we're here to solicit input. This is not necessarily a large open conversation where we're going to have a back and forth, but the plan has been out there. It's been posted to the website, and we would like to hear your comments on the plan. Um, statutorily, they will be included in the plan, and we will provide some kind of response to them. So can we go to the next slide? We'll go over the agenda real quick. So basically what's going to happen is I'm going to stop talking in a minute, and Alex is going to go over and give a rough slide deck of what is included in the 10-year telecom plan. Um, I would like to ask people to keep their comments initially to three minutes, if possible. After everybody has a, had a chance to go, we will open the floor back up for longer extended comments as appropriate. Um, we're all adults here. Let's all make sure we keep it polite and civil as we move forward. And with that, I will turn it over to Alex, and hopefully I didn't miss anything. No, that was great. Thank you, Hunter. So um, just a few quick uh, another uh, other housekeeping things before we begin. So I'm going to walk through this deck that shares some of the highlights of the 10 year plan. Uh, it is impossible to completely summarize uh, the plan in a slide deck. And so please don't take this to be uh, exclusive or exhaustive of what's in the plan. I'm hoping that if you're providing comment, you get a chance to read the plan and the original document. But in order to um, spark thinking and just remind folks who are watching what the plan contains, we're going to go over this deck. The second thing is if you have comments in writing that you're going to read from today, um, it would help us out if you also sent those to us via email, then we could include those directly. But as Hunter mentioned, we'll also be taking a transcription. So next slide, please, Harley. So a little bit of context about this particular plan, uh, the 2024 plan. As always, the plan is guided by the telecommunications goals listed in statute. And this plan provides analysis and recommendations to support the state's efforts in achieving those goals. It's also uh, the entire process of the plan uh, is laid out in statute as well. And so this plan follows that process. Um, the moment of time when it when it uh, is happening in 2024 is, is notable because uh, we are in the midst of a significant amount of federal resources being provided to the state to target certain types of broadband deployments. And so the intent of the 2024 plan is to build on the momentum created by all of those uh, resources from the ARPA Capital Projects Fund and the BEAD Fund, the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment. And um, some of those federal resources come with very uh, strict and prescribed rules about how the state can use them. And so, uh, and a, and those resources also require a separate planning process and a parallel planning process that happened during the creation of this plan. And so the other piece of important context is that this plan, uh, you know, has follows statute and addresses all of the statutory requirements. However, it also places a special focus on elements that are not being addressed in the simultaneous 
deed planning that is being required by the federal government. Um, and that's just to be efficient with resources and to provide a deeper perspective on some of the items that are not already being addressed in parallel. Next slide, please. So a robust amount of qualitative and quantitative research underpins the analysis and recommendations in the plan. A quick selection of that uh, is as follows. Uh, the plan, uh, as part of the plan, we did a landline and cell phone survey of a statistically significant sampling of Vermont residents. Um, we also surveyed Vermont businesses, healthcare professionals, and public safety professionals via online surveys. Um, we interviewed, uh, it's actually closer to 60 at this point, uh, stakeholders. Um, we did a statewide mobile wireless engineering and cover coverage analysis. Um, we did a really uh, a robust uh, analysis called an input-output analysis that allows us to understand the gaps in the workforce in the state of Vermont related to broadband construction. There's obviously uh, more in the plan, but this is a highlight, a selection of highlights, I think, of of uh, pieces of research that are important to note going into this. Next slide. Great. Oh. So I'll go through a selection of the findings that we think are, are important and salient to the recommendations. On the next slide, we have uh, yep, a finding that perhaps uh, is the most obvious because we've seen it happening all around us, right? Fiber coverage is expanding rapidly in the state. It's expanding so fast that the, uh, the uh, data sources we have to even understand it are, uh, are uh, can't keep up because it's construction is constantly happening. So households with access to 100 meg symmetrical um, doubled between 2021 and 2023. Vermont is on track to pass all on-grid premises by 2029 with a with 100 symmetrical fiber. Um, you know, related to this fiber expansion, uh, our analysis determined that Vermont really needs to grow its broadband construction workforce. Um, the sector had been shrinking uh, prior to 2022, um, and if we've got uh, an estimated up to $700 million of fiber deployments still ahead of us. Um, you know, the, the workforce is going to need to grow by about 750 across a number of occupational categories. A couple other findings. Um, one thing that many stakeholders noted uh, was that fiber infrastructure's owners may need to bury portions of the network in the next 10 to 15 years as part of utility hardening and becoming more resilient to climate change. Um, and the process and costs and protocols associated with that are not clear. And, um, and uh, a number of stakeholders really desire clarity around how that's going to work, how that will be coordinated, uh, and if there's a role for the state to play to coordinate more efficiency on that front. Another important finding um, just related to the state's efforts to achieve the goal of universal fiber deployment is that the Agency of Transportation um, is no longer issuing right-of-way permit waivers, which they had been doing for a while in, in for infrastructure builders in unserved areas to ease the, uh, uh, the economics of deploying in the really rural areas. Next slide. So a couple interesting findings on the mobile wireless service. Um, so, you know, stakeholders reiterated how important the service was. You know, 80% of businesses indicated that they did not think that the Vermont's mobile wireless coverage is adequate for their business needs. Um, and and the a clear majority of residents strongly agreed that the state should use public funds to improve mobile wireless coverage. Um, and while mobile download speeds have increased quite significantly since 2018, coverage areas have seen almost no improvements. So there's actually little to no expansion of service areas happening, happened in the last five years. Um, another, but lastly, an important finding from the engineering analysis is that um, it, we looked at the entirety of the gaps in the state and uh, the analysis showed that strategically placed small wireless facilities, which we um, measured at 50 feet, can make significant progress towards closing a good portion of the coverage gaps. 
right? So the, in, in comparison, we did a, a similar analysis for more traditional 140 foot towers. And while, uh, you know, while the efficiency of those 140 foot towers um, is notable for the hardest to serve areas, the point of this analysis was that it actually demonstrated that Vermont could make significant progress with smaller facilities, um, at least for the easiest to serve areas that currently don't have coverage from any provider. Next slide. Um, affordability is obviously critical. And uh, during the creation of this plan, it was uh, it it uh, came about that the affordable uh, connectivity program at the federal level is sunsetting due to uh, lack of funding. Um, you know that program provided a thirty dollar a month subsidy for about twenty four thousand Vermonters uh, to either help them with their mobile wireless bill or their fixed coverage. Um, and we we some interesting stats about how how critical affordability is. Um, you know, for example, sixteen percent of respondents under the age of forty five reported that the cost of their mobile bill often or always impacts essential items. Um, and uh, uh, you know participation in the ACP was uh, was notable, especially among certain populations who really needed that coverage. Um, Another lastly finding related to mobile broadband affordability is healthcare workers we surveyed noted that without continuous mobile coverage and access devices, um, unhoused Vermonters uh, have a lot harder time accessing care. Next slide. Um, you know, public safety was a component of this 10 year plan, as everyone knows. Um, you know, mobile coverage was a big theme in those uh, conversations as well. Um, you know, due to conversations happening in the legislature, we also uh, spent a, a lot of ink discussing the uh, pros and cons of public safety answering point consolidation, and the advantages and disadvantages from a uh, from a coverage and process standpoint. Uh, the advantages being, you know, some increased staffing flexibility, um, more resources for statewide emergencies and potentially long-term cost savings, right? Disadvantages include uh, a big startup cost uh, to switch the systems over, um, you know, a, a reduction in uh, local knowledge due to the fact that the people answering may not be from that area and um, you need to establish new redundancy and failure processes. So anyways, it's a, it's a big section in the plan. Please do check it out if, if you haven't, if you want to comment on this. Um, Another finding, uh, stakeholders reported that, look, that we've got a statewide communication interoperability plan, um, and while there are some federal grant resources available to work on some of those uh, pieces, it's a, a lack of funding at the state level has been a big barrier to executing on those goals. And then lastly, um, you know, over 50 FirstNet sites have been deployed, some new construction and others kind of upgrades to existing facilities, um, which is good progress. Um, that being said, only 5% of the public safety survey respondents reported never losing mobile service on the job. Um, lastly, uh, uh, under the direction of uh, some of the stakeholders we interviewed, and especially the JITOC committee, we did take a look at the statutes governing the plan in and of themselves. We had a few different recommendations. One, um, you know, the broadband speed definitions and deployment parameters are starting to lag behind other states, and there's some, uh, you know, uh, there's some um, kind of slight misalignment across statute. Um, you know, the statutorily mandated end date for the Vermont Community Broadband Board, um, you know, uh, we feel might be too soon um, because there are bead program activities that are likely to happen after that date. Um, and then we, we spent a lot of time discussing some of the statutory goals, which were first drafted 40 years ago. And uh, we have a recommendation that the legislature revisit those goals and clarify them and add some more specificity. To them. So now I think we're into the uh, summary of some of our recommendations. Move ahead. So uh, we have some recommendations about how the state can take some actions to make wireline deployment more efficient. Again, some of this is dictated by 
uh, federal statute that's attached to the uh, bead funding that the state has available. But nevertheless, there are things the state can do. Um, we recommend reinstating the uh, Agency of Transportation permit fee waivers, which will help reduce the challenge of the economics of deploying rural areas. Um, you know, we uh, you know we appreciate and uh, commend the workforce training that's going on in the state already, but that does need to be scaled. Uh, to accommodate the amount of construction that will need to happen and um, you know calibrated based on that the gaps that we identified in, in our analysis. Um, and then lastly, the state is in a is in the position where they should be the ones driving clarity around the the future process of burying infrastructure as utilities underground their infrastructure over the next fifteen years. And uh, you know that part of, Driving clarity around that will will mean understanding the potential impact to ISP and uh, fiber infrastructure owner financials and their business plans, and also providing a central coordination role to um, create savings and align uh, people all working on this to be as efficient as possible. Um, we feel that to start making progress on uh, wireless, mobile wireless gaps, that the state should um, deploy what we're calling a pilot grant program. And this grant program, we recommend focusing on those small wireless facilities that, again, can um, make meaningful and efficient coverage progress in the state, while also um, you know, not not having as much of an impact on the landscape as 140 foot towers do. Uh, we recommend a, a, a two to three million dollar initial pilot program here. The the um, the plan has detailed recommendations about what we think that pilot program should look like. Um, but a, may, a, a critical piece of it is collecting certain pieces of data to then refine it, because this is a an effort that the state uh, that will be new for the state uh, to some degree. Um, we also have a number of recommendations about data collection practices uh, writ large um, and ways that the state can strengthen their planning abilities to better measure progress, including repetition of uh, mobile broadband drive tests using the same methodology done in 2022, the establishment of a crowdsourced drive test um, uh, framework to collect data on the roads that the um, that the, uh, the the previous drive test did not collect, um, and then uh, a, a slight change in the 248A uh, data collection process, which would be to request that permit recipients notify the Public Service Department upon completion of tower builds. Um, affordability uh, has a number of recommendations in that section. Uh, a couple highlights here. We recommend using a 2% of monthly income benchmark as a definition of affordable for fixed and mobile broadband spending for low-income Vermonters. Uh, we have charts extrapolating what that means in the plan. Uh, and to really allow Vermonters to have both a mobile and a fixed subscription, which stakeholders, uh, you know, overwhelmingly said was necessary for uh, was necessary for Vermonters. Um, we believe a, a state-run subsidy program should provide sixty-seven dollars a month to support those both of those types of subscriptions, um, and we also believe that a fully subsidized mobile device and mobile subscription. Um, program for unhoused Vermonters in particular would uh, would really benefit uh, that population and ensure continued access to services. So again, the big theme of of some of the emergency communications um, is you know they they have there's a plan in place for how to increase the resiliency of those systems and evolve those systems. Uh, there are pieces that simply need to be funded. Um, and then on the public safety answering point discussion, um, you know, if the stakeholders support uh, taking another step down the path of consolidation based on the analysis provided in the plan, um, we recommend uh, performing a detailed kind of consolidation plan to uh, go in great depth as to what the costs would be for that and the process to do that.
And then lastly, we provided some recommendations to modernize statutes. Um, so, you know, again, there needs to be an exercise in aligning the uh, 202C and D with X71. There's a little, there's a few pieces that are not fully harmonized. Um, we do believe that the Vermont Community Broadband Board sunset date should be um, extended. Um, and there are ways in which the statutory goals should be updated. Just one example here, um, you know, there's a goal of competition in the state. Uh, that was set quite some time ago, and there's a way to update this goal to reflect the practices that the state has been promoting by uh, changing the goal to reflect what the intended outcomes of competition are, namely faster speeds, lower costs, better customer service, um, rather than competition itself. So that's just one example of, uh, of ways that the statutory goals could be updated and made more specific based on the strategies that the state is currently taking. I think that is the end of the presentation. So um, now we are at the at the time when anyone who wants to share thoughts on the plan may, and we will uh, ask that you keep your comments to three minutes to start until everyone has had a chance to go. Okay, so for folks on the phone, if you would like to uh, raise your hand, um, and then we can call on you as you want to comment, just so we're not all talking over each other. Good looking out, Steve. So, we're here for another 38 minutes anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, they can unmute, and there's a there's a raise your hand function on there where it'll make like a little virtual hand go up. That's true. If you dial in. All these people are connected in with teams, otherwise they would just be telephone numbers. Okay. You wanna get started? I was hoping not to go first or last, but I... <laughs> Um, I think just to set the tone, which I will uh, change later, uh, I want to commend a couple of sections of the plan. The analysis of the importance and the challenges of developing carrier grade service on our fiber infrastructure or on the new built fiber infrastructure is very good. Unfortunately, it's done in the context of expecting CUDs to do that, which is almost laughable. Um, had a open access statutory compliance been built into the CUD plans from the start, as is required by current statute, not the statute we're hoping will be someday, then I could imagine carrier grade service providers jumping on and leasing the circuits they need to the points they need them to and developing carrier grade services. That is probably the only way we're gonna get carrier grade out of this. Uh, this ties somewhat together with the study of burying. If they're currently piloting the direct burial with Green Mountain Power, but yet the cost to add a conduit where they're already got the ditch open were so exorbitant for fiber to go in that it was waived. The opportunity was waived in the pilot. And then another section of underground yet to be done uh, was going to require hundreds of thousands in the replacement poles and Bell Vance decides they'll just charge that amount to drop the conduit in. So the, I believe that if we're going to do a study of direct burial communications and fiber in the same operation as direct burial of the Green Mountain Power Electric, it's going to have to be regulated like a rate case. And it's, that plan is long overdue because now all the CUDs have aerial plans, which it may be too late to uh, switch horses. So 
Um, the neutral host uh, analysis, or I haven't seen the actual propagation analysis, but the analysis that so many lower poles in a small cell arrangement, I think is a smart idea and could work better in Vermont. Again, the assumption that the CUDs would own, build, and manage those is a, is a fallacy. CUDs could barely, uh, in any case, I'll, I'll uh, refrain. This, the, this CUD myopic uh, draft, uh, aspect of this draft is, I believe, a result of the same firm writing the plan, which is the same firm that wrote the last plan and failed on nine out of 10 statutory requirements, is also doing the engineering work for the CUD within the department, for the CUD plan review within the department. So some of this you know, future pro projections is kind of self-serving, self-serving make work for you know the department and CTC to have further uh, butter for their bread. But I'm going to point to some of the flaws in the process. I read the statute very literally, and I'm familiar with it for 30 years now. Um, and what's prior to preparing the plan? An overview looking 10 years ahead of statewide growth and development as they relate to future telecommunications service. That's missing. That's not in here. Uh, shifts in transportation modes, economic development, technological advances, that's not in here. The factors that will significantly affect state telecommunications policy programs, that's not in here. The overview shall include economic demographic forecasts sufficient to determine infrastructure investments, goals, and objectives. That's not in here. That's prior to preparing a plan. So you've really gotten out ahead of yourselves in preparing a draft without reading what the precursors are. Um, the surveys are pretty good, but I question the uh, statistically significant of the number of people that were uh, surveyed. Um, I'd like I'd have to talk to somebody who knows survey methodology better than I to see what's appropriate for this kind of scale. Uh, we used to have hundreds of people in the 90s. We had hundreds of people participating in this planning process. And it's the department's failure to write a plan, failure to properly promulgate it, failure to hold hearings on a final draft, failure to even draft a plan for several of the generations under O'Brien and Douglas uh, that has caused this capacity of the public to atrophy. And it, so when I read that uh, in developing the department shall establish a participatory planning process that includes effective provisions for increased public participation. This doesn't cut it. You know, three meetings with one or two people, Adam, is not anywhere close to what you're you need to be doing to draft such an important document. That's if all the homework were done first and put out for review. So. Uh, To the extent necessary, I guess that's I want, in, whose de, in whose determination, the department shall include in the plan surveys to determine existing needed and desirable plant improvements and extensions, access and coordination between telecommunications providers, methods of operation, and any changes that will produce better service or reduce cost. Those are things that this contractor is to embed with the CUDs and their plans to even think outside the box. You know, this this broadband money uh, was on, had we, we had one good model with WEC and CV Fiber. For a time, I was integrally involved with CV Fiber. And that fell apart because this easy money made it, it too easy to go and just take the money and not worry about, not worry about WEC getting a low interest RUS loan. So, the pole owning utilities in order both for resilience planning, for public safety and carrier grade capacity and the ability to rapid restoral, that having the skilled technicians in 
in state and readily at hand and ready and prepared and expecting a storm with their trucks and tools and parts loaded is not going to happen the way we've gone about it. We've gone about it with a bunch of out of state, especially consolidated, a bunch of out of state non union fly by night contractors. And then they leave town and nobody can even figure out why this, you know, splitter's not lighting up. So the pole owning utilities, and it may be too late, but, but where we are in the plan, I'm, I'm going to keep raising it in case there's structural re, uh, re-steering that can be done. The pole owning utilities should be, especially in the underground, if we're going to go underground, even more so, because then we don't have in, increased cost of ditching that fiber underground. It's going to go in as Green Mountain Power buries their own. Steve? Yeah? I don't mean to interrupt you, but when you have a moment to pause, just so we can check and see if anyone else has any comments yet. I'll pause right there. Stephen, would you uh, be able to state your full name for the record, too? Sure, Steve Whitaker from Montpelier. Thank you. Thank you. And since I'm doing that, I want to point out, I would ask people to go look at Appendix G of the last 10-year telecom plan. And I put pages and pages of constructive and specific recommendations regarding resiliency and public safety needs. And it was all just swept off the table. Whoever was doing that, I presume it was Corey. Uh, you would know if you were doing it. Uh, I, I know it wasn't Clay, so. Um, but my point is, if, if that that's again damaging the public participation. If you're going to bother to participate and provide a lot of input, and it's just going to get swept off and ignored, uh, that doesn't bode well for you adhering to statute with your public participation. So the poll owning utilities should well, be. Let's, let's make sure no one else on the phone wants to. Then we can come right back to you. I Bye. thought I just did that. Okay. I don't know if I gave him one. Does anyone else uh, on the phone have a comment they'd like to to add? All right. Back to you, Stephen. Thank you. So the poll owning utilities are the logical entity to build, own, and maintain and lease open access fiber. Competition, you know, wishful thinking that we're going to get the benefits of competition just by saying we're going to get the benefits of competition with monopolies is, is la la land. You know, the competition creates an incentive of smart teams of people working against each other to drive prices down and drive quality and, and loyalty up. And that's a proven fact again and again. And we're, and statute says it, you can't be writing a plan for a statute you hope to change in years to come. And that's what this is. This says we're gonna plow ahead with a monopoly service. We're gonna keep all the monopoly arrangements secret between you know, Waitsfield Face then or GWI and the CUDs, and we're gonna grant huge new footprints to monopolies. We're not gonna address, here's a gap, the vulnerability of unpowered lines for landlines is increasing dramatically as we shift to fiber. And there's been a PUC docket on it, which the department, your department sabotaged, and nothing came out of it. Oh, we're just going to teach people to maintain batteries. It's like, that's, that's a joke. Old people are not going to go in their basement and check on batteries to see if they're too old to be relied upon during a storm. Uh, we need strategies to make emergency calling available via fixed wireless that's hardened backhaul to public safety grade that can be reached with a short walk from most of the residences or we need to maintain the copper. But this reliability, we just, we see this pages and pages of propaganda about FirstNet, and yet no, no mention of the massive outage on February 22nd, which took down all AT&T service nationwide, including FirstNet. And no one can answer why, and the investigation will be secret. The after action report will be secret. No mention of how FirstNet could fail over with priority and preemption to other carriers in a neutral host model that we 
design and implement properly, not relying on CUDs. That's that's putting way too much faith and, and confidence in CUDs. So um, I heard the goals were drafted four years ago. These goals have been drafted in uh, 20 years ago, 30 years, 87 is when our this statute requiring this plan was first passed. And then the it was about 10 years ago, it was 10 years ago that we put the 100 to 100 by 2024 in place. And here it is, 2024, and said, oh, let's move it to 2029. I'm like, if we had had this plan in place when the ARPA money came, or not this plan, but a real plan, when the ARPA money got here, we might have made some progress, and we might have even made it by 2025, because the B money's coming out slower, right? Um, we got covered most. Covered the costs. Oh, little to no service area expansion in cellular in the last five years, and yet we say, oh, AT&T's got 50 new towers. Uh, AT&T definitely defrauded the state with their promises and they were caught when we, the state paid Televay to go measure the coverage down in, 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 in Bennington County, and the coverage wasn't there. And AT&T basically told the state, pound sand, we measure it differently. Take it up with Washington. We don't answer to you. And that's, that's why we shouldn't be advertising for them in, in this pretending that they're the only game in town with priority and preemption. No mention that Verizon has priority and preemption that any first responder can sign up and scan their card credential and get priority and preemption turned on, you know? And what of a neutral host model where multiple carriers can have priority and preemption and fail over to each other in a disaster where any one carrier goes down? I mean, that's what, we, that's what would be a plan. So, um, I don't understand what is being said. I, Montpelier was encouraged to bow out of EC Fiber. We were a founding member of EC Fiber. We were encouraged to bow out of EC Fiber and let CV Fiber. Instead, nobody built fiber until Consolidated got here, and now nobody will build fiber. They see the CUDs were not allowed to build in cabled areas where 25.3 was already present, is my understanding. And yet I'm hearing that we're on track to have 100 megabit symmetric, which means fiber, to every address in the state. And it just doesn't add up to me. There's something I'm not understanding about that representation. And it may be couched in the word, uh, we're going to pass all on-grid premises. That might mean that we're not going to have any breakout boxes or any service drops. We're just going to have run a long distance cable through those communities. But that doesn't count for every E911 address having 100, 100 fiber speed. So are we presuming that, are we pretending that the cable companies are gonna upgrade to DOCSIS 4 and have 100, 100 symmetric? But it's already time. The Telecommunications and Connectivity Advisory Board hasn't met in years and has not provided any advice on upgrading the speed. It's time for our base speed to be gigabit symmetric. But are we going to have that at every address, including the cabled addresses? Or are we pretending that the cabled addresses or the limitation on the ARPA money gives us a free pass to not provide fiber service to those addresses? That's, that's a, a need for clarification here because it doesn't add up that we're not building, the CUDs are not designing, as far as I know, we're not designing the areas that are cable built. You're not allowed to use this money for that. And yet, we're representing that we're on track to have every on-grid address so fiber served. And then fiber served with competition. I mean, the opening chapter, the opening paragraph of the plan says, uh, the department shall be responsible for the revision of plans for meeting emerging trends related to telecommunications, technology, markets, financing, and competition. You can't just say competition, oh, that's inconvenient. You know, that'll make us work harder. That'll make us have to design 
active fiber and ethernet networks instead of passive so that we can, with a few keystrokes, move somebody to a competitor that can keep the data turned on. So I've got a nice marked up copy of the draft and of the, uh, but I don't want to preoccupy this hearing, but I think the fact that nobody showed up, oh, the, the access media organization, the department shall coordinate with Vermont's access media organizations when planning the public hearings required by this subsection. That's these hearings this week and next, and there's been no coordination with the access media organizations. That's why you don't have any turnout here, among other things. But you need advertising, you need radio advertising, you need speakers on VPR, you know, ahead of time to say this is a big under deal, undertaking we're taking on, and we need to, you know, get everybody up to speed. Here's some homework you can do ahead of time. You know, here's how to understand this plan. That work hasn't been done. And you inherited this mess, I understand, um, but we, we really need to rethink how we're going about it. At this point, I'm thinking we need to ex create uh, an amendment to a bill that's moving related to telecom and extend the due date and get this done right. And that's not going to be by Reese and CTC. They're conflicted and they've, they should pay back the money they collected for the last plan, which was not anywhere near close to the contractual terms. Thank you. Do you want to submit that writing or do you want us to transcribe that? I think it's already transcribed. Okay. And there'll be more. We're here two more times. And probably a lot more than that. We appreciate your input, Stephen. And we're still here for another 18 minutes. Who made the decision that you can't do a back and forth and argue the merits or? I think this is a, this is just to solicit the input for the plan. Well, who made that decision? It's not precluded here in statute. Why it. is this different than your all your off the record interviews? Because I scheduled this meeting as just a public input session, just so we could collect input. We'll respond to it. Like I said, anything that is a yeah, but I want the unvarnished response. I, I don't want the, <laughs> the combed and spun, you know? I mean, somebody needs to see what you know and what you don't know, and who's, pull, who's pulling the puppet strings. Like I said, we'll, we'll put it in the plan and we'll respond to it. Well, I have trouble encouraging people to come if they're not going to get any feedback on their concerns during the hearings. Understood. Do you know who the people are? H Q A T D B and K O? I have names on the screen. Who else? Oh, I lost one of them. No, I don't recognize the name. I, I don't recognize them as uh, as CUD people. I recognize them as uh, the two interpreters. Yeah, and, um, and everyone yeah. else is um, um, folks from Rizzi. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not sure who Kristen is. Yeah, Kristen yeah, Chris is. She with you? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it was an, Sorry, echo. It was an echo. So where was this advertised? This was advertised on WCAX, the Department of Libraries, and the Department website press release. I looked at the website today. There's no thing about the telecom plan or about the hearings on the homepage. In fact, you got to you got to dig. It, I, in fact, you could you couldn't find it all unless you went to the. Uh, document section of the telecom division. 
The, the homepage had nothing about the telecom plan under, initiated or nothing about the hearings this week. Is in the announcement sections on the right hand side. I don't know where it is now. I think some other oh. announcements have been made. I'll look at since it. then. Oh, it, you mean it pushed off? But, uh, I don't go to our homepage a lot. Well, you probably need some professional help getting the that's what the AMOs were designed. I helped write this statute and the AMO participation was to help get the involved crowd, the invested crowd and even the impacted but unknowledgeable who want to get knowledgeable AARP and you know did it was any bulk mailing sent out to any of these groups? No, we advertise on WCAX. The libraries. WC, you paid for advertising on CX or you just got them to cover that you were going to happen? Online, they're considered a statewide advertising. So if you need to notify the whole state, they're considered one of the advertisers that has statewide. Coverage. I don't go to the, I wouldn't go to there and I'm a pretty media savvy person. Oh, another thing that's missing, uh, the whole microwave system is missing. While they're embarking upon a $99 million uh, upgrade, uh, which isn't in the state's ADS plans either. But there's an entire public safety task force that is uh, already got a contractor underway who's going to do a PSAP call volume fees analysis. And they really need to do it coupled with this. It's another reason to slow this uh, rickety train down and get it on the right track. And that's going to be, be a year long process. But the amount of knowledge we will have about radio systems, the regionally owned radio systems, the state owned radio systems, the, the opportunity for cost effective concurrent design and build of LTE and LMR. If public safety is going to have to densify their whole network to get P25 working, why aren't we putting LTE and LMR neutral host on those same poles in order to achieve the most cost effective solution? Because they're all going to need generators, they're all going to need fiber backhaul or microwave backhaul. But then the statewide microwave system is a huge T totally missing from the plan, unless it's that reference to, you know, the state police's LMR backhaul, which is both fiber and least fiber. But the opportunity to redo the 911 system on a shared high performance network, you know, there's no reason we couldn't have a network like Menlo Park and teach people to use it and attract people to come here and build businesses on it. But the reason it's not happening is because we can't seem to get a plan together. Thank you. <laughs> you think? I'll throw another two cents in here. Um, yeah, 10 more minutes, Stephen. The uh, look at it, sub nine, B, B9, analysis of alternative strategies to leverage the state's ownership and management of the right of way, public right of way. 
to create opportunities for accelerating the build out of fiber optic broadband and for increasing network resiliency capacity. That was the language that was put into Act 71, the broadband, that created the broadband board that said a statewide engineered resilient design was both allowed and fund fundable with those funds. The broadband board chose not to do it on the claim that it would have slowed us down by two years. Well, here we are three years later and we're, it, it's coming back to, to roost that the lack of that statewide design means we're not prepared with the resilience design to know where we would bury fiber with Green Mountain Power to create a carrier grade hurricane proofed core network. What role should Velcro's aerial fiber play? What role, what's the potential of using similar Sienna dense wave division muxes at every CUD homed to two different Velcro muxes to create a backbone that is self-healing and or quickly restorable via, even if we have to go through New Hampshire and New York to get somebody lit back up after a fiber break. But that combined with underground fiber strategy to support all the antennas that will be putting up for this public safety initiative would have given us the best bang for the buck and probably come in under budget. And so you wouldn't have all the pull make ready costs, you wouldn't have all the, the pull attachment costs. Central Vermont fiber is $400,000 a year for, for attachment costs. Those wouldn't exist if the pole owners built, owned and maintained the fiber and just leased it open access. CUDs would have a much simpler job. How did you get so far off course? I could take advantage of this one-way conversation. <laughs> Uh, another thing, the neutral host analysis for small cells failed to include issue of spectrum. You know, we, FirstNet has 20 megahertz of valuable 700 megahertz spectrum. Uh, VTEL's got a lot of 700. The advantage that T-Mobile has around the rest of the country with the 2.5 spectrum is owned locally here. CBS, CBRS priority licenses are owned locally here in every county. We've got a lot of spectrum that could do a lot of good if we wrote a plan that takes maximum advantage of it. Are we going to keep, you know, I've talked to the Mac Mountain people and I don't, I don't argue with the concept of neutral host, but I don't think we're gonna get the carrier's attention one and two sites at a time. I think we would have to have aggregated the whole 200 sites or 400 sites and say, we can provide this much additional coverage. But if we didn't even get to the 76% that AT&T had offered in their secret plan to the governor, uh, and experts have said we should be shooting for 95% coverage. Uh, and if your in-laws come into town and they're on Verizon, or you're on Verizon and they're on AT&T, y'all aren't connecting, you know? So in, in the dead zones. So any state money at all should not go into single carrier solutions because it doesn't help. Uh, and think about it from the public safety point of view. Let's assume all three major carriers had priority and preemption turned on for all eligible. But the, in a mutual aid, Vermont is mostly volunteers, 5,000 volunteers. They come from faraway areas. If they come from an area served by AT&T and they're coming to an area served by Verizon, their devices aren't gonna work, right? Without priority preemption roaming. So the, 
this, just the safety imperative itself and the uh, increased coverage and the resiliency of failover for FirstNet and or for Verizon Public Safety. I forget what they call their public safety offering. Uh, that brand name should have been in here too. I just forget. I don't give me that talk about yeah. it a few weeks ago. Yeah, and I don't know what T-Mobile's offering is either. But my point is that there's an opportunity to do this right. And the plan is the place to flesh that out. Not with, not by trying to undermine our competition statutes and not by trying to you know, set up the department as a grant maker. Let's you know, teach y'all to write a plan first before we have you handing out grants. The Telecommunications and Connectivity Advisory Board hasn't met in years, but back when they did, they gave $16,000 per address to Comcast to build some addresses in Norwich one of the wealthiest towns in the state. So we, there's a reference to all the Wi-Fi that was put up during the first year of the COVID pandemic, and nobody checked or logged the backhaul capacity that was feeding those. I mean, it was a lot of squandered money. And with it, you know, nobody checked the battery backup. Nobody checked the longevity. Nobody put a contract under how long, and they were, charged annual maintenance fee. Equipment was picked that required an a renewing an annual license for the software to use the, the Wi-Fi access point. Talk about encouraging people to turn it off, you know? It was a, almost as big a fiasco as giving away all the coverage co cells for a dollar or a hundred dollars or whatever it was. The cabinets were one cabinet was worth that for our future small cell endeavors. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> I know you don't mean it. At least it. you know what to expect. Um, we have a couple minutes left. We can wrap up. If there's no more comments from anyone on the phone, I would like to thank our two interpreters. Appreciate it. And thank Rizzy for being on the phone or on the meeting with us. We will do this again Wednesday night, same place, same time, uh, 5 p.m. here. And um, with that, everybody have a good night. Thank you.